Hello, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland woodworker. Let's see what we have in store for you today. This time on the Highland Woodworker. Woodworking in America. I thought it was great. It was a lot of fun. Wow. At about the time it would take to watch the morning weather, we have put a perfect cutting edge on that tool. Popular Woodworking's Matthew T. gives us a guided tour, then a quick tip on sharpening your scraper. And then these are hollowed out. Those are hollowed out, like like the inside of a rhubarb stalk. All organic. All organic. That's the Craig Nut way. <laughs> that is. <laughs> organic woodworking at its finest. Meet the master behind these colorful creations. Bert the wood expert. His topic is exotics. What you need to know about these imported woods. Get an edge on your next project the importance of a good set of chisels. All of this and more, this time on the Highland Woodworker. The Highland Woodworker is brought to you by Highland Woodworking. Fine tools delivered to your door since 1978. This portion of the Highland Woodworker is presented by Forest Manufacturing, saw blades for smooth, quiet, precise cuts, Guaranteed. Masterpiece Wood Finishes, helping you build beautiful furniture. Gorilla Glue, for the toughest jobs on planet Earth. And by Popular Woodworking Magazine. I'm at Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. This is like Disneyland for a woodworker. They've got all the tools and classes and a great staff to help you with your next project. Popular Woodworking has an event called Woodworking in America. It's an event so big that woodworkers of all levels get together for fun and learning. Let's go see. It's an excellent place to be. It's great, you know, I've traveled a long ways to come see some of the best builders and uh, tool makers and learn a lot about some hand tools. So if you clamp it, the bench is gonna go before your workpiece goes. I come for the people, <laughs> more than the woodworking, but I really enjoy it. About seven minutes ago, I beat that with a hatchet. <laughs> At about the time it would take to watch the morning weather, we have put a perfect cutting edge on that too. Hello, Matthew Teague. Hey, Chuck, good to see you. It looks like Woodworking in America. It's Tell here. me about it. What is it? Uh, woodworking in America, we started this show about five years ago. It started out primarily as a hand tool woodworking show, and I think the first one sold out in about two or three weeks. And over the years, we've done more shows, and the show's gotten bigger every year. Now it includes some power tool woodworking and it just keep, keeps getting bigger and a stronger show. We've got a lot of exhibitors on the, the marketplace and then upstairs we've got some of the best instructors out there teaching. So there's Roy Underhill, Frank Klaus, Curtis Buchanan's building a Windsor chair, a little bit of everything. And it, it's nice here because you can actually get your hands on the tools and use them, which you can't always do in a catalog. Matt, you got everything here. Yeah, that's what I love about the show. There is a little bit of everything here and a lot of new tools every year. Um, only thing I like as well or possibly better than new tools, they were old tools. So this is kind of my, my weak spot over here. The everlasting chisels, I saw these yesterday and these are, I just love these things. Uh, Some so of the when classics. I see a, when I see a bucket of these, I know I'm gonna have to wow. get my wallet out before I leave. This isn't a collection, this is an, an illness. This is just stuff that I buy and sell. It started out as a collection, but ultimately it led to buying and selling so I could buy more for my collection and for restoring my house that I, took apart and put back up and it's a long story you don't have enough time so in this part of the hall we have a number of different classrooms and over a dozen instructors uh, at any one time there are at least a half dozen classes going on so you can find something you'll like uh, and you can see here Adam Cherubini who writes our arts and mysteries column uh, does all hand tool woodworking he's teaching right now 18th century tricks of the trade yeah. what's a real quick trick Ah, I have, a, I have a great trick. Um, this is my uh, mortising cage. I made it myself. It's a fun weekend project. Um, and as you can see, it has four sets of double pins that marks out the tenon or mortise. 
Each of these has been filed to match one of the chisels in my set. So I never have to adjust uh, the, the pin spacing. I just move the, the arm back and forth to set where I need to be. Let's see, sorry about that. So you can slide the head back and forth to get just where you want to be. You can mark any one of those widths of uh, mortises you want. It's kind of a That's a great century. time saver because you're always having to try to match it up and get the pins to, to match your, right. your chisel. Right. It's well, that's a great. Clever little tool, I think. Well, Matthew, if you're a chair maker, you really gotta gotta see Jeff Miller. You do, yeah. My very first chair I built straight out of Jeff's book, and uh, I don't I don't know if I would have gotten into chair making otherwise. So I definitely want to catch him talking about furniture design. Jeff, I just love the way this chamfer comes down and kind of plays out in a nice little. Tongue it's a there. great transition from the thicker legs, which had to be thicker around here for uh -huh. the joints, to then come right into the thinner side rails. Yeah. And, uh, and it flows, because you've got a, a hard edge, which you're very familiar with, sure. um, or a harder edge here that, that comes and, and brings the continuity from one to the other. Yeah, and that little return around that corner kind of says, it, it says that the designer cared. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's, well, I that's cared a lot about this one. I'm starting to see sawdust everywhere. I understand there's a hand tool Olympics. That's right. Yeah, we've been doing this a number of years now, so it's a way to kind of test everybody's hand tool skills. I hear you're pretty good with hand oh, tools. Oh man, I can saw. Let me show you. I can beat anybody sawing. Let's give it a shot. Go. <laughs> enjoyed woodworking in America. I mean, and right here, we've got all the DVDs and books from shopwoodworking.com and Popular Woodworking Magazine. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for coming. We enjoyed having you. Hopefully you'll come back next year. Next year? Anything special for next year? There will be a lot special. Uh, we are in the process of scouting a couple places. Not sure where it's going to be, but that'll be up on our website soon at popularwoodworking.com. Hey, that's great. Now, just recently, you showed me how to improve the sharpening of my scraper. That's right, yeah, card scraper, one of my favorite tools. Probably my favorite tool of, in my whole shop, I think. All right, well, let's go look at that now. Sounds good. Matthew, I've seen this great, aggressive edge that you put on a scraper. I want to see how you do it. Oh, it's, pr it's pretty easy. It's a three-step process. The first thing you want to do is the edge of this, you want to just square it up. So to start with, you'll flatten the faces of it. Uh, sometimes I'll use a wet dry sandpaper. If it really needs a lot of work, you can throw some water on there with a drop of uh, dish detergent in it. Gives you a little lubrication. This one I've used for years. It's in pretty good shape. The only part of it that really matters at this point is the very edge. Because that's where you're going to turn the burr. I'm just going to work that back and forth. You want to make sure you've got good fresh steel so that your square edge here is consistent all the way down. Just an easy way to do that is just to take a permanent marker, run it down the edge, get you a nice black line. And I'll just use a mill file at about a 45 degree angle. Run it down the length. And you want to see you want to see clean steel all the way down. So I'll come back again. You could use wet dry. This is a little more coarse diamond stone. You can do it like this and hold it at 90 degrees. If you want to cheat a little bit, and it's not cheating, it's just a smart way to do it. Just got a block. can feel it's just getting a little a little smoother on that edge. Again, you could do the same thing on the sandpaper. This is a finer grit. It's about a 1200 diamond stone. Once you get a good square edge, we're going to go to the next step, which is drawing the steel out. Um, you're going to use a burnisher to try to pull this steel down, and that's what will eventually turn into your burr. Uh, you do this with a burnisher. This is really nothing 
more than just a, a piece of steel that's harder than whatever your scraper is. So to draw this edge out, I just put it on the edge of my bench. And you want to push in this direction out. Make sure you're not pushing into the scraper. Matthew, is now the time to turn the burr? It is, yeah. Once you've got a nice edge and the, the steel has been drawn out, you're going to want to take that and kind of turn it over the side, and you'll do that with the burnisher. I'm going to place it about an 8 to 3 16ths inch or so down. Uh, that can vary depending on how wide your block is and what angle you want to get. Some people will do them almost at 90 degrees to just kind of mushroom that out just a little bit. Um, one or two degrees gives you a nice finish cut. By doing this, I'm able to register my burnisher here and on the edge of the scraper. So just a couple of passes keeps that angle consistent all the way down. And you can feel that edge on it. And you can feel that it's consistent also. You I can. love that. You can. Yeah. Now, to get a more aggressive cut, like you mentioned before, I also like to turn a more aggressive angle burr on this one. So I'll take the same burnisher, register the handle just against my workbench, and push down. You want to keep in pretty much a straight line here, but that'll keep your angle nice and consistent. Now, if you haven't used one before, tricky thing is to get the angle right. It's not always a, the same angle. It depends on the angle of your bevel. You want to get your fingers behind it. And as a friend of mine, Eric Kyle in Pennsylvania, once taught me, push like you're pushing a truck out of the mud. Well, that's great. And you've got a refrigerator magnet there? What's yeah, that this, for? This, well, you're cutting, and this steel gets really hot as you're cutting. It'll blister your fingers. Um, it will even with this on, but it gives you a few more passes. Oh, that's just outstanding. Look at those shavings. And very consistent surface, too. It is. You should be able to go straight from this to finishing. I, I can't wait to get back in my shop and try what you taught me today. Thank you so much, Matthew. Great. Thank you, Chuck. Coming up next on the Highland Woodworker, Bert the Wood Expert goes international. Why exotic wood might do your next project some good. Chisels, getting the most out of these cutting edge tools. Then Craig Nutt, from fine furniture to veggie tables. Spend a moment with this imaginative master. You're watching the Highland Woodworker. Masterpiece Wood Finish is a special three-part oil and wax system designed to enhance the beauty of wood. It's easy to apply, maintain, and repair. Applying several coats of the base coat, mid coat, and top coat to a prepared wood surface will create a finish that will make a craftsman smile. I helped develop Masterpiece Wood Finish, not just for your masterpiece, but mine too. Behind that garage door lies a kingdom, a place where all that's wrong and broken can be fixed. Armed with Gorilla Glue, imagination, and some elbow grease, there's nothing that can't be built, created, or repaired. Your kingdom awaits. Gorilla, for the toughest jobs on planet Earth, visit GorillaGlue.com. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for over 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises, to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, go to highlandwoodworking.com. This portion of the Highland Woodworker is presented by Whiteside Machine Company, top quality, industrial grade, American made.
JDS, leaders in air filtration, dust collection, and woodworking machinery. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. Peach State Lumber Products, your source for high-grade hardwoods. Highland Woodworkers are found all over the world. Email a picture of you and your woodworking project along with your name and where you live to picture at thehighlandwoodworker.com. I'm in the wood room at Highland Woodworking and I'm considering using an exotic hardwood for my next project. Let's go talk to Bert, the wood expert at Peach State Lumber and we'll find out all we need to know. Bert, I wanted to find out about exotic woods, exotic hardwoods. Can you tell me about them? I sure can. We have three of our more popular ones right here. As far as exotics go, that refers to anything grown outside of North America. Primarily Africa and South America are two big producers of the so-called exotics. All right, so this is Cocobolo. It sure is. It, some of the characteristics of Cocobolo, some people are extremely allergic to it. So I would uh, advise some caution if you're not sure about that. We're uh, going to find out in just a minute. <laughs> uh, it is a very hard, heavy, and strong wood. It typically comes in short lengths and somewhat narrow. The color can vary greatly from orange to red to purple. Uh, it grows mostly on the Pacific coast of South America all the way up to Mexico. And it, it is a- beautiful. It, it sure is. It's actually a, a, what they call a musical wood. It, it produces a tone effect when struck on the ground or something like that. So a lot of musical people do like it. You know, it kind of looks like it belongs maybe in the rosewood family. It is. It, it's, it's actually one of the true South American rosewoods. Now, rosewood is a real general term. There are literally, you know, hundreds of different types of rosewood. What is this dark brown and black wood? This is wingy. This comes out of the western part of Africa. It's characterized by a really, like you said, a really black, followed by brown in there. It's in the uh, uh, family similar to a wood called Panga Panga. But one of the characteristics of this, it's very splintery. You really have to watch the splinters on this. It has to be sanded really good. Uh, it has to be worked with a sharp tool. All of these woods are very heavy and hard. Uh, it does machine well. And it's also characteristic by quarter sawn and plain sawn, much like our white oak. What do people use the wingy for? One of my customers that uses most of this builds countertops out of it. You can use wingy for just about anything uh, as long as you're willing to work with it. Uh, it. It comes in very good sizes, very good lengths, four quarter and eight quarter primarily are the two thicknesses. And it's, it's a beautiful wood. It definitely has a place unlike any of your uh, domestic hardwoods as it's a very consistent dark black, slightly brown color. We've got another wood over here that's uh, more of a reddish color. Uh, do you want to tell me about it? This is actually Bobinga, also out of Africa. It's one of our more popular exotics. It's one of my personal favorites too. A lot of people refer to Bobinga as African rosewood. However, it is not in the mm. rosewood family. <laughs> it just looks like, like it belongs. It is extremely hard. It does work easily. It polishes very well. Uh, it machines very well. Uh, as far as the exotics go, it's probably one of the easier ones to work with. Thank you so much, Bert. All right, thanks for coming. About 35 years ago, I started woodworking and I needed some good chisels. Chisels, especially beveled edge chisels, are used for paring and for fitting joints and for cleaning up all kinds of surfaces. Uh, they're just your workhorse at your workbench. 
All you need to do if you get a good set of chisels is to get yourself a leather strop for honing and something to charge it with. It has a nice abrasive in it. And I like to use flex cut gold, but there are some other great choices out there too. Just rub a little bit on there and then you're gonna work that secondary bevel. This is a primary bevel here, and you're gonna lift it up just a little bit off that bevel and lightly strop that edge, making that secondary bevel. If you push down too hard, you're gonna round it over. But I'm preparing this chisel to do that cutting. Now, on Narex chisels, you've got great value, very good edge retention, and you've got a wooden handle that can be used for striking, and a bolster here to keep it from blowing apart if you have to strike it real hard. And once you get that, that edge honed, you're ready to go. Now, Narex chisels come in this great set there's a set of six here uh, in a box, and that'll keep your edges protected too. Once you get them nice and honed, uh, you'll want to protect them so that you can pick it up and know it's ready to cut every time. And if you decide you want to do some mortising, these will work well for light mortising, but Narex also makes a chisel that has no bevels on the side. It's just a tough guy and it's made to mortise. And look at that, straight down. Narex chisels, they're the perfect value from Highland Woodworking. Still ahead, you've heard of the Concord, but have you heard of the Corn Cord? You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Rikon Power Tools. Tools designed by woodworkers. it to Atlanta, then you can always shop us on the web at www.highlandwoodworking.com. Moment with a Master is presented by Masterpiece Wood Finishes, helping you build beautiful furniture. A celery chair with peppers, carrots, and snow peas. Now that's organic woodworking. That's the work of Craig Nutt. Let's go to Kingston Springs, Tennessee, and spend a moment with a master. I've always been a maker. I've always been uh, interested in how things were made and how they were put together. Um, you know, I was uh, uh, terribly disappointed as a kid when I couldn't find my toolbox in my uh, uh, Christmas stocking. Well, this is a recycling piece. 
you know, everything these days you need to be thinking about how to recycle it back into nature. And so I, uh, you know, there's a, a book that a lot of us read when uh, back in the 70s, I think, uh, called uh, by John Alexander, Make a Chair from a Tree. Sure. And uh, so I thought, well, what about making a tree from a chair? If I want to <laughs> recycle uh, my furniture back to the, uh, uh, back into a tree, um, you know, I've made, a, I've made a chair from a tree, and that's pretty hard. I found out that it's really even harder to put it back into a tree. And you've got all the parts here, it looks It's like. all the parts to the chair. It's a, a chair I picked up at Habitat for Humanities. And, uh, you know, I think it makes a pretty good piece of firewood. As a tree, it doesn't quite make it, I'm afraid. And so you carved bark back onto carved the parts. Bark back and, onto oh, it. that's wonderful. You got glue blocks over there. and. Uh, oh, the whole chair is in there. It's it, it's one whole chair. Yep. Well, if, it's a tree. <laughs> <laughs> it's a start. I love it. Craig Nutt's hand-built studio is in this rustic Tennessee setting. This is the place where Craig's left and right brain intersect. Well, I started out in school in, uh, in pre-med, and, um, you know, most of my first years in, in college were things like you know, mathematics and chemistry and biology. Uh, and then I really got introduced to um, some art courses and really got interested in uh, painting and oil painting. From there, Craig began restoring antique furniture and mastering his woodworking skills. His organic works of functional art have appeared in galleries and exhibitions all across North America, earning him numerous awards, commissions, and acclaim. Eventually I started thinking that, that the furniture could be artwork as well and I could kind of put, uh, invest all that creative energy that I had been spreading out in music and painting into making furniture that was uniquely my own. I mean, it's kind of a long road to the, uh, to the vegetable pieces because I, I started doing very straightforward uh, uh, functional pieces of furniture initially. Uh, but I had always been growing a vegetable garden. Ever since I started making uh, furniture, we had uh, uh, gardened uh, as much as anything as a means of survival, but also got addicted to fresh organic food. And, uh, and I think the vegetable pieces started when I was, uh, got in a situation where I didn't have a place to garden at that time. Craig's garden of furniture is fascinating in form and in function. And just like tending his outdoor garden, Craig has a unique process for producing these fine pieces. This piece is a, um, a table to seat six, and so I had the um, idea of doing a uh, rhubarb table, and I usually start with a, uh, a scale model, and I kind of think of these they're not really, uh, I don't spend a lot of time on the models. The, I don't want the model to be the actual piece and to get that involved. They're just stuck together with hot melt glue. Uh, they're uh, kind of worked out, roughed out as quickly as I can so I don't get attached to the model. And if the, uh, if the piece isn't working out, you know, I feel comfortable about like ripping a leg off of it and redoing the legs or changing the top. Sure. Um, and you haven't wasted a big piece of wood in all that time. Exactly, because it's going to look something like this. I'm leaving myself enough leeway to, because when I make a piece, I always make changes. I always see something uh, as I'm working on the piece that's a better idea than when I had, the, the one I had when I started on it. So, and I usually reserve some decisions till the final thing, you know, what, what certain parts of it are going to look like. Um, I know I can put that off, that the basic thing is going to go together fine. And so, you know, basically I have a, uh, something I can show the clients and say it's going to look pretty much like this. Uh, maybe I haven't decided about the colors. Uh, so, you know, like up here on the board, I might do color studies. What would this look like with rhubarb stalks or chard? What if I put veins in the top? Um, what if I do the, the legs different colors? And so I can quickly uh, do different versions of the piece, or even on some pieces, uh, you know, I've done cabinets that started out as pepper cabinets, but I thought, oh, well, what would that look like as an okra cabinet? So I can use actually the same model and then just kind of fudge it in so it looks like an okra 
or I could try different uh, pulls on it. Do I want handles on it? What would that look like? So I could very quickly try that without, um, you know, in making a, a final decision on it. This looks like the butter bean chair that you were working on in there had the little model on That's it. right, that's right. These are the back legs of the model uh, and the back legs of the chair. Um, there's a, this area here that's kind of cylindrical is where the uh, bean back fits into the leg. It actually wraps around the back leg. Here's one of the beans. I see. So that uh, fits around it this way and then the um, upholstery fits in that way. Well, that's just marvelous. Now, how do you arrive at such a, a, a nice sweep here? Is there a lot of work involved in that? Uh, well, there is. The legs are steam bent uh, first to get the, um, uh, to rough out the curve, and then they're sawn and, and shaped. Uh, the joints are cut before the shaping starts. And uh, th these ones actually, I normally would use a mortise and tenon joint, but this joins into a, um, a bent apron. And the way it, um, the front legs fasten with a mortise and tenon joint that's like a slip tenon. But these, and I'm not sure if that's a left or a right. Let's see, I think that's a right side. So these fit into the apron this way, and then there's a bolt goes in here into a nut that's embedded in the, uh, in the leg. I guess this is actually this side. Oh wait, I have it upside. No, that's right. <laughs> well, that's just marvelous. Anyway, you get the idea. Sure, that is fabulous. Here's one of your signature rhubarb tables. You've got it in, pro in process already. Right, I'm working on laying the top out and uh, trying to mark out the way the carving is going to be on it. Uh, I'm. Uh, kind of sketching out just the segments of the top and then I'm uh, kind of laying out uh, the way the um, the way the leaves are going to kind of undulate in the top. I'm trying to be a little irregular about it and so it has an organic look to it. Um, so I'll mark these leaves out and then I'll kind of indicate here approximately how it's going to be carved. These will be uh, scooped out here on the top and these hollows here will be will be scooped out on the bottom side so the edge of the top rolls and it's really the it's really where this edge goes that defines how you perceive the shape of the top uh, they'll be will be cut out here in between the leaves so they'll look like they uh, lap over one another so again your your model really helps you lay this out exactly well, that's wonderful. The pedestal is just beautiful. Now, the pedestal is what in, in your mind? The, the pedestal are the, is uh, rhubarb stalks that uh, wow. um, are kind of joined uh, in a bunch. Uh, it, we can take the top off. Craig, I just love this. Tell me about it. How did you make it? Well, it's basically the, the legs are um, joined to a core. We'll turn it upside down and sure. you can see underneath it. It's a hexagonal core, and then these are, have a mortise and tenon joint between the legs and the core. And then these are hollowed out. Those are hollowed out, like, a, like the inside of a rhubarb stalk. All organic. All organic. That's the Craig Nut way. <laughs> that is. <laughs> organic, outside of the box, and open-minded. A lot of people will uh, dismiss their best ideas before they have a ch chance to find out if they're a good idea or not. And just because uh, your initial take on it is, uh, oh, this is ridiculous, this is stupid, nobody would buy this, nobody would put this in their home. I mean, all those things are working against you uh, following your impulses and, and, uh, and exploring to see if they go anywhere. You know, maybe you find out after working with them for a while that they really are stupid ideas. and. Uh, but being open to that kind of thing kind of opened some doors for me. One big door opened when Craig was commissioned to provide a sculpture for the Atlanta Airport's International Terminal. Craig's corny idea had wings, or should I say shucks in this case. The corn cord is uh, about 10 feet long and it has a 10 foot shuck span. Uh, it's made out of uh, tulip poplar uh, painted with oil paints. 
you know, I don't know exactly how much it weighs. It's, um, it's probably not as heavy as it looks, maybe 150 pounds, I guess. What eye-catching project Craig will build next is always up in the air, but it's his philosophy on his work that keeps him grounded as a master craftsman. It occurred to me that, uh, that we were building things, we were making things that were made to not to last, and we were building a planet that was made not to last. And, and uh, if I could make pieces as though they were going to last for generations, maybe that value might catch on. And uh, you know, even though I didn't have any reason to believe that anybody cared if I made anything that lasted, uh, I think when you make something that's well made, it communicates something. And it communicates something about uh, what I think is, a, is a, an ethic of craftsmanship, which is about uh, uh, making a world that is, is worth taking into another generation. Thank you so much for watching the show. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Until next time, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. The Highland Woodworker is brought to you by Highland Woodworking. Find tools delivered to your door since 1978 and these fine sponsors forest manufacturing saw blades for smooth quiet precise cuts guaranteed whiteside machine company top quality industrial grade american made masterpiece wood finishes helping you build beautiful furniture peach state lumber products your source for high-grade hardwoods. JDS, leaders in air filtration, dust collection, and woodworking machinery. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. Gorilla Glue, for the toughest jobs on planet Earth. And by Popular Woodworking Magazine.